I wanted to talk to you about climate change. We used to call it uh, global warming. But what happened in the last 20, 30 years, in addition to the entire planet warming, we were seeing huge changes, droughts, floods, species extinction, glaciers melting. <clears throat> so we decided to call it climate change. But just in the last 10 years, the changes are so dramatic. And for example, India is experiencing the, the worst heat wave, but 123 degrees since last two weeks. So we now think we have to call it climate disruption. And, and many of us, like me, were working on this problem for the last three, four decades, feel we have to, might be facing an existential threat. Fortunately, there is overwhelming support from scientists, policymakers, and global leaders that we have to do something now. Uh, just to give you one spectacular illustration of that, in November of last year, 195 leaders, including President Obama, President Xi from uh, China, they all met and signed on a piece of paper that global warming is real, it's caused by us, and we have to do something about it soon, which is good so far. But the problem is the actions proposed are quite minuscule, incremental. What we need are drastic actions. And why are we not taking that? We simply don't have the public support. So I have a proposal to you that there are two steps we need. We need to bring in religion, an alliance between science, policy, and religion to get that transformational public support. And the second thing is, individual actions matter. It's gonna to have to happen from bottom up. That's exactly why I am here. I'm so happy to see a sea of young faces, although you all look very dark from here. <laughs> <coughs> so let's start with the major culprit, which is carbon dioxide. It's a colorless gas. Anything you burn, coal, oil, gas, firewood for barbecue, all becomes carbon dioxide, okay? How much have we dumped? We unfortunately crossed a major milestone this year. This carbon dioxide in the air, which is concentration was 280, ignore the PPM, it's parts per million. It's increased by 42% to 400, okay? In terms of the sheer weight, that's close to one trillion tons of this gas zipping around in the air. That's equivalent to 500 billion cars we have tossed into the atmosphere. And it's gonna stay there for a century, if not longer. So why should we worry about this blanket of gases? Just like on a cold winter night, it keeps you warm by a blanket which traps your body heat. This blanket of CO2 <coughs> traps the heat from the planet which would have otherwise gone to space, okay? And there's been mu mu numerous predictions of, of how it'll impact climate, and sadly, all of them have come true. Just to give you one example, my own work, I published a paper 36 years ago when the planet was still in a cooling trend, and we said, this warming by CO2 would be detected because the climate fluctuates. We said the signal would rise by 2000. And lo and behold, in 2001 was when an international panel of 1,000 scientists declared we are seeing the human-induced warming. Using the same approach, data, observations, and theory and models, <coughs> I have predicted in 2008 and 2010 that we will see a degree and a half warming in 20 years. Mind you, that's your lifetime, okay? The planet has already warmed by a degree. To see a planet which was as warm as one and a half degrees, you have to go back in time 125,000 years ago when the sea level was up by what, 30 meters or 100 feet. And I'm also predicting 
that by 2050, over 35 years, the planet would shoot past two degrees. To see a planet which is as warm by two degrees, you have to go back millions of years. We have not seen such a planet in the last million years. What it holds for you, <clears throat> I can't really reliably predict, but I know based on the current experience, there will be droughts, floods, fires, sea level rise, and species extinction, etc. I would like all of you to remember May 20th, 20th of 2050. Most of you would be alive. I don't see anyone as old as I am in the audience. I hope you'll realize I heard this old Indian professor telling me we would see this, okay? So what do we need to do? We have to bend that curve. Everything is going up. Population, our pollution, warming. We have to bend that curve. So how do we bend the curve? That's exactly the question. About 50 UC, University of California scientists in all 10 campuses, I was privileged to lead this group, and we published 10 solutions. Okay? It's very rare for academics to do that. We mainly raise problems and let society to solve the problem. <laughs> okay? So just to give you one of that, <clears throat> we basically have two levers to bend that curve. First, of course, is the carbon dioxide. What do we have to do? Simply change our fuel instead of fossil fuel, go to renewables, wind, solar, biogas, hydrogen, there are a number of options. But that lever is very slow. It needs a Hercules to pull that down. That's an entire seven billion have to work on it. And it's gonna take time. But we are going rushing to that cliff of two degrees. So fortunately, we have a second lever. <clears throat> there are four other pollutants, we call them short-lived pollutants, who are contributing half to the warming, and we have technology to bring them down. That would give us, cut down the rate of warming by 50%. So as scientists, we know what to do, but it's not happening. Again, going back to lack of public support. So this is where, uh, let's see, what bringing religion, and I'm gonna rely on my work with the Vatican, Pope Francis, the Dalai Lama, to tell you what's happening there, it's a miracle is happening. But what's the angle you need to get to the religion? <clears throat> First, this has become a huge moral ethical problem. This pollution was released by my generation. There's only a trillion tons. It's gonna stay up there for a century or more. And it's gonna melt glaciers, impact climate for the next several centuries. So generations to be born, your grandchildren and your grandchildren's grandchildren are going to suffer through this. They are not at the table to make that decision. The second is what I call intra-generation equity. <clears throat> Let me address that by talking about my current world. I see the planet, we have two worlds. The first world is top one billion and we are contributing as much as 60% to the global warming pollution. Compare that with the bottom three billion, still relying on firewood and dung, basic needs as cooking. I spent a sabbatical living in villages. In fact, that woman <clears throat> in a village in Himalayas is cooking my breakfast. I don't know if you see a cat there competing for my breakfast on the floor. And she has nothing. We have left behind three billion people. And their contribution to this pollution is less than 5%. And you know, if there is a severe drought like what's happening in California, it would wipe them out. Because they rely on food from the land, okay? So that's the moral ethical issue. So I realized this about 10 years ago didn't know what to do about it. And I had by the time published about 150 papers 
So I saw my life work as a colossal waste. Nothing is happening. And I'm just watching us rushing towards this cliff. And then I got an opening. 12 years ago, I received an invitation. This Pope, uh, John Paul II, now he's Saint John Paul II, elect me, electing me to the Pontifical Academy of Science. And we organized meetings there. We briefed the Pope after each meeting. And there when I realized the power of religion in this problem. So we organized a series of meetings which culminated in this conclave in 2014. Mind you, this meeting, we had Nobel laureates, top engineers, top scientists. And we came to one remarkable conclusion. The solution to this problem requires the fundamental change in our attitude towards each other and to nature. So I had the privilege at the end of the meeting to brief uh, Pope Francis. Normally, when you have audience with the Pope, it's in the most spectacular room in St. Peter's Basilica. But this Pope, living up to his reputation, met us in the parking lot of the Vatican. So I was given two minutes to brief him. So the first sentence I told him about how serious climate change problem is, then I talked to him about that's more than 50% of the climate pollution is caused by the wealthy one billion, and the worst consequences are going to be experienced in the bottom three billion. So Pope Francis, at that moment, is looking at me and asking me, what can he do about this? So I mentioned briefly to you about this alliance. Then, over the last two years, series of meetings were organized at the Vatican, just impressive, bringing in uh, UN Secretary General like Ban Ki-moon, this particular meeting I'm showing you is a meeting of all the city mayors. On the right hand, you can see uh, our governor, Jerry Brown. You see me sitting on the podium looking very worried because Pope Francis was supposed to address us and he didn't show up for about 10 minutes. So fortunately, he did show up. And, and clearly now, and then the encyclical was released and we had a major role at the Paris summit. I went there as Pope Francis science advisor. So I'm gonna to talk to you about two issues now. I'm switch on to what can we do, individual action like I said is gonna solve this problem. Let me give you one example. Go back to the bottom three billion. Their pollution, cooking with firewood and dung, it kills three million women and children indoors, inhaling this pollution. So we came up with this clean stove. It took us five, six years. But the problem was it was too expensive. It was $80. Their family paycheck is a dollar a day. So my daughter who worked with me, she's a wireless technologist, hooked up each of the stove with a simple wireless sensor. And the data comes to our lab. This is started by University of California, San Diego. We convert that into carbon credits. By cooking with the clean stove, this woman is cutting down the carbon footprint by five tons every year. And we give her about $13 a ton, so she earns a check. So we just finished it with about 5,000 women in India. Basically, we are transforming women in villages in India and now Nigeria into climate warriors. So they are becoming our role model to tell us we can sol solve the climate change problem, okay? So let me just say conclude with what you students you can do and uh, also non-students. First, to get that massive public support, my effort of bringing the religion alliance, I'm hoping that this would be taught in every church, every synagogue, every mosque, every temple. That's the only way we're going to get that massive public support. But that's not enough. You students have to know we are leaving this problem behind for you to solve. So you've got to educate your friends, neighbors, and colleagues. To do that, you have to get yourself educated about environment, climate change. And you can organize community events. I think we now, 
think, artists, musicians, paint, painters, and plays, you can have a huge row. I'm thinking one of you would be inspired by my talk and compose a song on bending the curve. It's a nice slogan. To, uh, and, 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 and this is a famous place for arts. So painting, that's what's going to be needed. Community events. Of course, the solution technology for those of you can already go solar, buy local stuff. Transportation is the biggest contributor to global warming. Cars, trucks, and I, my banana comes travels 5,000 miles. My flowers come 10,000 miles away from Indonesia. So if we can go local, we'll have a huge impact. Eliminate waste. I'll give you a shocking statistic. 40% of the food grown is thrown away. That's contributing about 3 billion tons every year. Okay, So remember that. A lot of energy is wasted. You all need to get a seat at the table. It's your future. And I saw in the Paris negotiations, it's mainly old men and women like me. We need younger voices, loud and clear. Okay. And last, before you can do all this, you have to change your attitude towards nature. It's not limitless. We can't abuse it. When we take something, we put it back, just like in a relationship, right? You can't take constantly from the other person. That relationship would be bankrupt. Same way with nature and towards each other. Thank you.